Good afternoon. Um, I come here with a spirit of humility. Um, I'm not an expert in the area of zero carbon buildings, um, mainly because I don't know that there is such a thing ever possible. Um, the very nature of building and creating something that people then live in um, is a process that necessarily involves um, expending energy and with all of the implications of that. Um, now, one could say that um, you could have offsets, you could plant trees. Um, personally, I see the argument, but I don't like it as an argument. Because what offsets do when you're looking at building or anything else, or driving large trucks, or whatever the emission happens to come from, is that it suddenly makes it okay to behave badly. Um, it's like going around hitting little old ladies over the head, but if you say your Hail Mary and uh, go to church three times within a month, um, the sin has gone away. Um, I actually think the focus must and should be on hitting the emissions where they occur and not buying an offset over there so that you don't change your behaviour. Anyway, I digress. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Patrick um, at Kaingora and the great work that Kaingora are doing um, leading um, some of the thinking in this area. They have the balance sheet, the budget, and more importantly, the senior leadership to actually carry through and, I think, be a pin very important leaders in this area. Um, but first, um, I've given you the one disclaimer that I'm no expert in this area. Um, I'll um, move to my first slide. Um, it took some time to find an even mildly acceptable photo of myself. Um, I didn't actually um, prepare this slide, otherwise that wouldn't be there, but there you go. Um, but these are pictures of some projects we've done, um, not all of them, but there are three in particular that I'm really proud of. And they're the ones that aren't the new buildings. And I'm proud of them because they were buildings built many, many decades ago that have been repurposed to a new life, a new relevance, and dare I say, their carbon footprint is a heck of a lot more healthy than some of the new ones. And that's not because the new ones are bad, that's the nature of the process. So we spend a lot of time as a business looking and thinking about how best to minimise our footprint, to walk lightly, to, to try and leave the place better than we found it. Um, and that's a big team effort. So one of the key things we do, we're very careful who we work with, our consultants, our builders, our bankers, our staff. And if you get really good people, they like working with other really good people. And if really good people are working together, they enjoy it. So they stick around. And as they all work together and collaborate, they get better and better. They argue less, risk diminishes because they're used to working with each other. And that's our model. We don't come to work in the morning to make lots of money, which is the normal thing and how people regard developers. We've got enough, most of us got a house, and we're very lucky. We, we come to try and do a really good job as best we can within the skills we were given. And we enjoy it, and we're blessed to be doing it. So, as time's gone by, we've really focused on a relatively narrow area, and it's large-scale mixed-use developments, often on the waterfront in New Zealand. Why? Because I started the business, and I really like working in that area. So it's quite a selfish act, really. Um, and, and we've been very blessed over the years to be trusted by local and central government with a number of projects, typically always competitive processes, that we've worked on and built. And I'll talk to you uh, a bit more about one project in particular at Wynyard Quarter. Um, 
Now, the task at hand. Um, I've been a grumpy old man for some time, but I've been very grumpy for the last two or three years. This whole thing about carbon, we've known since 1956, carbon and the impact on climate change. This is not news, right? We haven't walked lightly. We've squandered just about every resource God gave us. So now we've got to deal with it. And why I'm getting grumpy in the area I'm in is the disproportionate emphasis is on emissions by buildings over their life. There is a disproportionately inappropriate emphasis on that, in my view, compared with the carbon footprint up front. To get below two degrees, we've got to actually really do stuff in the next five years. Not look at a 50-year life cycle of a building and say how blessed and what good citizens we were by making a building five-star green. I showed you a picture of Choose Lane there before, and that project was what started me on the path to grumpiness. And I was grumpy because when that building was rated for green stars, out of the nine buildings that were originally there, some going back over 100 years, we managed to save five. The, the others were just shot, or one was a large tin shed. Now, we got zero points on the assessment for saving five old buildings. Zero. But we got points because there was a bus stop outside. So it, it was just like the battle was there and the whole paradigm and the scoring was over there. Now, to be fair to the Green Building Council, they've got a heck of a lot better and they're very much on the programme. But that... That was when I started getting a little bit cynical about this stuff. Um, because here is a real challenge, and we're trying to take it seriously. Um, um, the Climate Change Commission target is in the blue, and our current path globally is in the black. That's not good, and whoever you are, you've got to do your bit. And I wouldn't claim we're a magnificent leader. We're, we're just really trying to catch up, to be really frank. Um, this is just very briefly uh, a look at emissions out of buildings versus total emissions. Um, and you can see on the left one, um, globally, buildings are about 38%, buildings in construction. In New Zealand, it's only 20%. Not obviously through our wonderful building industry or development industry, simply because we've got a lot of cows and sheep. They completely skew the statistics. So it's extraordinary, though, what you can do with graphs because in the wrong hands, this is very dangerous. This could be used to say, what a magnificent building construction industry we are. We're twice as good as anyone else in the world. We're not. So MB put out these two very helpful graphs. Um, and I won't walk you through them. Basically, the one on the left is the life cycle of a building. And basically, from its genesis, planning, right through to when it's demolished. Hopefully, you don't have to demolish and you can repurpose. And a lot of that is about good design and planning up front. Um, going right through the graph on the right, right through to the commissioning and operation of building over its life. And you can see what I mean about that rather nasty little footprint uh, created up front and how it's incumbent on us to use what we've got in front of us uh, before racing out there to um, build a whole bunch of new green buildings. If there was ever an oxymoron, that would have to be it. Um, the, the reality of it, and I'm very proud of the new buildings we build, but the reality is construction and building creates a footprint. And that is not ideal. And we have to, because it's a lesser sin than having people living with no roof over their head or working in conditions that are 
completely suboptimal or unhealthy. So it's done for a reason, but it's a trade-off. Um, so this graph talks about the evolving understanding of embodied carbon. And again, um, there's not a lot of effort going to that big blue bar on the left. Well, there, there's more going in, to be fair. In the last 12, 24 months, a heck of a lot more effort has gone into that than previously, where, as I said before, a lot of the effort... And, and I'm not criticising the effort that went into emissions, but, you know, it's now time to look at that left blue bar as well. Um, so the current state of the play, we're looking for suitable alternatives. Now, really interesting that, because carbon's incredibly important as an issue, because it's leading to climate change, carbon emissions. But so is durability. So is not having to do it all again in 20 years, because the new innovative low-carbon product that was specified actually wasn't fit for purpose with the benefit of hindsight and failed. We don't want another leaky building situation, and that is the risk. So it's chicken and egg. Um, I'll talk about my personal journey searching for the zero carbon answer um, in a moment in regard to one project, but that, that sort of touches on those um, products. Um, um, and then we look in number three at integrating carbon efficiency into the design of a building through passive design. And I'm, I'm a real fan of that. I, I just, I look back at Wellington. Wellington is, in a, in a New Zealand sense, let alone a global sense, we're actually quite a temperate climate. It's a little bit cold in winter and it's a little bit hot in summer, but compared with the extremes in a lot of other places, it's not bad. Now, back in the good old days, if you were hot, you opened the window. And if you were cold, you closed it. And hopefully you'd reasonably insulated the building in the first place. Now, what we see in our industry, is a lot of consultants and experts and architects, God bless them, some of my best friends are architects, um, who specify buildings that are over-engineered with far too much mechanical. I won't name the building, but we built or designed with Athfields and uh, a guy called Chris Rowe from CORE, um, who's a very good mechanical designer, who's very much of the school, a large building, right? And we said, well, my brief to them was, I've been to London, right? And when I was over there, I looked at um, a type of building that was called white-collar um, factories. And really, they were just factories that had been repurposed and given a fancy name. But really, they were very low-tech buildings that worked. So I went to look at them. I went to meet the developers that were developing them. And I wanted to do one of those. So we designed this four-storey building with 15, 1,600 metre floor plates. And we designed it passively. Right? You know, not a lot to the north by way of windows. And, and so it did all the good things. We won't bore you with it all. And, um, and it was great. Very proud of it. And it didn't need much plant at all. And then we found a tenant, and the tenant got the consultants in. And you can write the script for what happened next, can't you? So that building has tens of millions of dollars of plant in it now to keep the temperature plus or minus two degrees, winter or summer. And the price we pay for that is a massive amount of carbon emissions that need never, in my humble view, have occurred. So when people talk about, you know, they want to be in a pleasant working environment, part of that is because someone decided one day they were cold over there, so that person who was cold, who actually could have probably shifted a bit, um, has led to this, this mantra, particularly in commercial construction, of pretty tight building 
uh, performance specifications, which lead to an enormous amount of energy being expended unnecessarily, in my humble view. Um, so also in this area, so we've got quality, durability, cost and amenity being the issues floating around in these substitute products on this journey to reducing our carbon footprint. But look, I'll just check the time here. It's not looking good. Um, but I'll, I'll try and speed up. I'll talk, I'll talk more quickly. Um, so two years ago, I thought, OK, I'm taking this seriously. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find the best in the world in this area, and I'm going to pick their brains, and we're going to solve this upfront problem of the carbon footprint on day one. So there was a conference in Paris, PropTech, second biggest property conference in Europe, right? Went there June, year before last. And I went in and there was a presentation on the greenest office building in the world, even better than the Bullet Centre, they claimed. So we go to this and it was built in Holland and all of that. And I walked in and I walked out because this stuff had so much stuff dripping off it. There was no way in my humble view that was a green building. The emissions were low, but the emissions that expended getting to a low emission building, I think, were breathtaking. The amount of plant in the thing, it was just, um, yeah, it, it, it was interesting. Um, so I thought, well, that's not the answer. So then I found the head of property for a global consultancy. I had an hour with him. And this was a very, very smart guy. And I said, well, look, everyone's spending all this time on, you know, energy expense. What about up front? How do, we, how do we drive this down? What's the answer? Because, look, we're from this little island by Antarctica. We don't know the answer. We want you to tell us. He said, look, that's a really good question, which was a, not a helpful answer for me. Um, so I thought, oh, well, you're no good. Um, so then we, I went to a couple of other things. And there were rays of sunshine. There, there was a, a building company in France who were involved with developing low-carbon cement. And there are a number of initiatives like that going on around the world, a number of you will be well aware of. Um, but then I got wind of perhaps the holy grail, the real answer. Consultants in the UK who consulted to some of the top FTSE uh, 100 companies and did their reviews and audits and all the rest of it. Really smart people and good people, I hasten to add. So I thought, God, they're the answer. Hopped on the plane, went to London. Watched New Zealand play cricket at Durham on the way through. But um, So went to London, met these guys, great people. Good question. We can do your report. Excellent. Um, so then I got the proposal for the report. It was to take a hypothetical building and let me know how a building that the composition wasn't quite clear of um, might have its carbon footprint lessened, and that would be £55,000. I thought, well, I don't know if that's quite where I'm going with this. So, so anyway, I decided to give up on everyone. I, I thought, I'm on my own here. And... Look, it's not really because I'm on my own. It's because I just ran out of energy trying to find the right people, right? So I thought, what you can't measure, you can't manage. So our journey is really simple. This is stage three of a development we're doing at Wynyard Quarter in Auckland. Stage one and two... Um, were two large apartment developments. This is the third, 166 apartments. And it's um, gone very well and all, all those good things. Stage one and two, we work with Panuku, and Panuku of the Auckland Council Development Arm, to their absolute credit, said, we want the buildings in here to have high sustainability performance. We said, excellent, we, we, we're up for that. Um, and they said, yeah, we, we reckon they should be Homestar, you know, high, six, seven, eight, you know, all that. We said, great, we're, we're in for that. So we then, um, for a whole bunch of other reasons, got the deal, signed up, and then we found out there was no such thing as a Homestar guide for multi-unit buildings. So our first step on the journey at Wynyard was actually paying the New Zealand 
Green Building Council to do the standard for Green Star multi-unit buildings. And then we set out to achieve it. And almost all the apartments um, we've built so far at Wynyard are either Homestar 7 or Homestar 8. So they only really need plant going maybe 20 days a year. So it's good, but it's not great, right? So this is where we're hoping to improve our performance. So the relevance of this building, which was designed by Studio uh, Pacific uh, and built by LT McGuinness, is this. Um, um, well, that's not quite that. Um, it's this. The value of that... Stop. I've got to stop. OK. So, thanks. One minute. 10,500 tonnes of carbon in that building. Our mission is now to reduce that. So we've got a programme going for the next stage we're building, and what you see on the right here are the different ways we can take carbon out of the next stage at Madden. Of that 10,500, 7,500 is up front, 2,500 in the rest of the life of the building, right? So we think we can credibly take two or 3,000 tonnes out and go from 10,000 over the life to 7,500. And that's the journey we're on. So as well as cost, quality and time, carbon's been around since 1956, but its relevance in building and our journey forward is a lot higher. And that's enough for me. Thanks for your time. <laughs>